My name is Christian Liddy, I've organised uh, this series um, and I've chaired a couple of them and spoken in another and I've really tried to get out of speaking this evening. <coughs> I thought I'd just say a couple of words to begin with. Um, I suppose firstly, Charles of the Forest, who would have thought that it was so interesting uh, and important? Um, uh, as we heard in the first event in the series, um, Charles of the Forest really gave Magna Carta its name, and it was debate and conflict about the forest that really drove conflict in the 13th century. Um, and in the weeks that followed uh, that first event, we've heard about the Charter of the Forest in a variety of contexts, um, in, uh, about dispute, contemporary disputes about public space um, and uh, ideas of citizenship, to last week's uh, talk involving uh, Guy Standing and Cherry Leonardi, uh, my colleague who I'm delighted to see here this evening, talking about uh, common rights, uh, land ownership, uh, and conflict between land ownership and land usage in a variety of contexts, both kind of British but also uh, African. Um, and tonight I'm really delighted that we're going to end, I hope, and I'm sure we will, um, uh, with a wonderful um, uh, series of talks uh, exploring the theme of memory, identity and landscape. And I just want to hand over to uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Colin Saunders, who's going to introduce the chair to you. Very much, and, and very warm welcome from, from me too from, to this last conversation celebration with Charter of the Forest. Um, in case you don't know me, I, I work on medieval literature, so I'm bringing a rather different perspective, and I think I'm here to chair this because my first book was about the forest, not in relation to the Charter of the Forest, I hasten to say, but in relation to medieval romance. So um, connected with being a landscape of adventure and transformation. And I think perhaps that nation of transformation is going to be um, an aspect of our subject today. Um, so I'd like really warmly to welcome our two speakers, um, Andy Wood, who's here, um, Professor of Early Modern History in Durham, and also um, Rob Cowan. Um, who is a, a journalist and, and author, and whose award-winning book, Common Ground, may well have drawn some of you here today. Um, and our subject is landscape, memory, and senses of place. So really thinking about the ways in which landscape, and especially the common ground created by the Charter of the Forest, is intimately connected with and shapes our sense of the past and the ways that memory works to connect us to and into the landscape, but also the transformative effects that landscape and place can have on us. They're shaping roles in our identities, both our individual identities and our communal identities. Of course, in, in the medieval context, um, and you know, the modern context, the Charter of the Forest underpins social identity, providing rights of property, providing use of common ground, things really intrinsic to ideas of citizenship and power. But also from early on, these material aspects of identity must have been interwoven with less tangible aspects shaped by the sense of place, by affective and imaginative connections with the landscape and its history. So I'm going to introduce first Andy Wood to talk about pre-modern senses of place, and then after that, Rob, to talk about his own experiences of, of common ground. Um, Andy's research is on English social history from the 15th right through to the 19th centuries, with forays into contemporary material as well. Um, and his particular specialisation has been the use of archival court records to, as it were, get at the mental world, especially of the middle and, and lower classes, traders, farmers, labourers, artisans, the poor. And he's also worked particularly on um, popular politics, riot and rebellion, the subjects in different ways of his first three books. But his fourth book, um, especially Apposite to tonight, The Memory of the People, which was published at Cambridge University Press in 2013, and which won the prestigious Leo Gershoy History Award. This book explores 
explores many of the themes of our, um, of our series, really, and especially that connection between landscape, place, and identity. And um, Andy looks at custom and popular senses of the past in early modern England and asks how ordinary people thought about the past um, and how popular memory and custom generated a past that in part legitimated, um, for example, their claims on space and resources. And Andy currently has a Rebekin Trust grant to work on everyday life and social relations in early modern England, which is going to lead to a fifth book with a wonderful title, Faith, Hope and Charity. So really who better to illuminate landscape, memory and place in relation to the task of the forest. Thanks for that, and thank you for inviting me. It's great to be, great to be here. Um, what I'll be talking about today, really, is um, the ways in which conflicts over rights on the land shift and change the ways in which people think about the land, the ways in which people's, ordinary people's perceptions of landscapes change as a result of parliamentary enclosure, as a result of conflicts over customary entitlements, conflicts between richer and poorer people within villages, conflicts between villages, but also conflicts between um, the gentry, the aristocracy, the women the elite of early modern England of 16th and 17th and 18th century England, and what that is called the lower and middle source of people, working class people, essentially. So, this is um, one of the sort of treasures, I suppose, of the Durham Special Collections, the Weirdale Trust. Um, it, up until the 1950s, set in a young farmer's house in Weirdale, and it housed a large collection of late medieval and early modern documents relating to um, tenurial um, aspects of customary law within Weirdale, within the valley of Weirdale. The documents were collected together in the 1650s and placed within the chest because of growing conflict between the local gentry and the tenants, um, the middling sort of farmers, the sheep farmers uh, of, of the valley, over the rights which they held, according to which they held land within Weirdale. And that dispute, was known as the tenant right dispute, had roots that went back to the late 15th and early 16th centuries, but had become particularly intense in the course of the 1650s in the, the Commonwealth period, as a result of which one particular landlord, Sir Arthur Hasselwick, took many of the tenants to London courts in order to try to undermine the very wide and substantial <coughs> rights which they held upon the land, rights to fixed rents, to wide common rights on the pastures, um, the forests, um, to strong inheritance rights. All of this Hasselwick wanted to sweep away and to create a system of land in the Vimmer Valley which was far more amenable to his interests as the landlord. He wanted to, to create a system of property relations um, which was far more fluid, but was far more, uh, 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 where he was far more able to manipulate the terms of tenants' tenure upon the land. So they collected together all the documents they could lay their hands on and, held, um, um, and collected them together into the Weird Ale Chest in the 1650s. And they did so because they wanted to create an archival repository which they could use to challenge Hasselrig's claims at law. They wanted to deploy written evidence in opposition to his written evidence um, at courts like Chancery, the, court of Chan the High Court of Chancery, and the High Court of, of what happens with the upper bench, um, what outside the reference the, the Commonwealth period was known as the King's or the Queen's bench. So the creation of the Weird Ale Chest was intended to sustain the tenants' rights at law. Um, so it's a collection of documents, which are nowadays held in the special collections at Durham uh, University, um, but which have been held, which have been pulled together by relatively humble men and women in order to validate the claims that they were making to strong rights upon the land. A lot of the material within the Weird Al chest, although obviously it's documentary in its form reflects on local oral traditions within the valley. Um, there are transcriptions often of um, legal testimony given by witnesses known as deponents, um, providing oral testimony 
concerning the rights which tenants were claiming upon the land and the ways in which those were embedded within, the lo within, within local memory. So you can use this material, although it takes a written form, although it takes a textual form, to get out aspects of oral culture, aspects of oral tradition within the valley. And as such, the records that will be at Elchester, although they're, they're remarkable in their own right, are in some respects typical of litigation across England and Wales in the early modern period concerning customary economies, concerning issues like pasture rights, the right to collect fuel, uh, the right to dig for coal or for other commercially exploitable minerals, the right to pasture your cows on the common, to collect, uh, to, to glean for corn, all rights which were protected by local custom, by manorial custom, and which existed as the deponents, as the witnesses will put it, time wherever memory of man is not to the contrary, or time out of the memory of man, by which they meant beyond living memory. And in the course of legal disputes over the course of the 16th and 17th centuries, as these kinds of rights became increasingly contested across England and Wales, um, law courts would adjudicate in these disputes and take down written testimony from local inhabitants, many of whom were illiterate, who would provide evidence concerning local traditions, local rights, local customs, office holding systems, um, local courts, which maintained a customary economy in rural and urban England. So, the way of Elchester is in some respects a brilliant and unique source, there's nothing quite like it as a, as a kind of institution, a local institution. But in a broader sense, it's characteristic of the kind of disputes that were coming before central courts in the 16th and 17th centuries, as richer people came into conflict with their, neighbor, with their poorer neighbours, as inhabitants of one village came into conflict with their, their, their neighbours further down the road, or as tenants came into conflict with men like Sir Arthur Hazelrick, with the, the gentry and nobility. All of them disputes which concerned local custom, and because local custom, those rights to glean or to uh, collect firewood or to dig for commercially exploitable minerals, because local custom was based in local memory, in order to demonstrate its legitimacy before a law court, uh, claims to custom had to demonstrate that it, had, uh, that it operated within a local jurisdiction, within a particular place, in this case, the forest of Weirdale, but the custom existed at a time wherever man, man is not to the contrary. Local custom was therefore about local memory, local in the sense of a particular jurisdiction, memory in the sense of time wherever man is managed not to the contrary. So the documents can be used to eliminate all sorts of aspects of ordinary people's mental worlds at a time of growing conflict engendered by the development of agrarian capitalism in England in the 16th and 17th centuries. But custom wasn't just about disputes over land rights. Custom was also something which regulated parochial life, parish life. Um, this is uh, an illustration, a map taken out of a commonplace book of uh, Darbyshire Gone called Leonard Wheatcroft in the 1680s. Um, and it depicts the perambulation route around his Derbyshire parish and the, the upland region of Scarsdale 100 and the the north of Derbyshire. Every year, parishioners would be expected to go the bounds of their parish on the custom, custom known as rogation tithe, where the parishioners before the Reformation would be attended by the minister, by choir boys who would sing psalms, um, by parish banners. The perambulations became increasingly secularised over the course of the 16th and 17th centuries as a result of the development of the Protestant Reformation. But nonetheless, they were making extremely important ways in which ordinary people were able to mark out the bounds of their communities um, and to communicate their knowledge of those boundaries down the generations. So, characteristically, boys, I've never found an example of this happening to go, but boys would be taken to boundary markers, they'd be shown where the boundary marker was, and they'd sometimes be cuffed about the ears and told, remember the boundary markers, one boy from the Northumberland village of Amble, he's told to sit on one particular uh, mere stone on his bare bottom, he's told to remember that this is where the mere stone was, because his bare bottom. <laughs> other, other boys are going lucky, the ones who weren't being beaten or whipped or banged on the head 
and on the boundary stones. Some, some boys would be given gifts of tuppence, or if they were really lucky, they might be given some ale to drink. Um, and the idea was to try to imprint in the minds of the boys of the village the wisdom of their elders in, a commun in communities in which age was a status, was a sign of status of belonging, of significant, uh, significant cultural presence within the community. So the perambulations were partly about age relations, but partly about rites of passage for teenage boys, um, but they're also about marking out a particular vision of the landscape, a particular vision of space within the land. <laughs> so this is a more stylized, modernized representation of the perambulation of Asher from 1687. And you'll see that it depicts um, sites such as the Seven Brethren, which are a, 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 a accumulation of um, standings, near, late Neolithic <laughs> standing stones, um, or bridges, or turning point, and another boundary stone near Crowder's Stone, uh, Pre-Reformation Cross, Crookthorn Cross. So the landscape is what landscape archaeologists call a kind of palimpsest, the landscape that, um, that um, Wheatcroft is describing in his book in 1687 is a, is a landscape made up of the, the, the accretion over generations, over centuries, millennia, of the use of the land by prehistoric people, by the Romans who built the trapways that ran across Ashover Moor, by medieval people who erected those stone crosses, and now by the people of Ashover in 1687 marking out their boundaries. So the landscape then can be considered as a kind of it can be considered as a kind of palimpsest of layers of different settlement, layers of different cultures, in which sites such as those seven brethren, the seven brothers, the seven stones are up on the moors of Ashover, which Wheatcroft picks out in his commonplace book, erected thousands of years in the past to give them a new meaning, this time as part of the boundary markers of an early modern community. The land vote was becoming a source of conflict within English society. As a result of falling rent rolls because of growing inflation over the course of the 16th century, aristocrats, gentlemen and noblemen, and noble women too, are looking for opportunities to raise revenue, to squeeze money out of their tenants. They're looking for ways in which they can asset strip their estates and closing common land, ratcheting up rents, reducing inheritance rights upon the land, squeezing the poor off the common, um, cutting down woodland, exploiting commercially uh, viable minerals like gritstone or lead or coal or down in the West Country tin. Landlords are looking at the land and seeing that it as a source of resources which they can, which, which they're, they're attempting to asset strip in order to bolster their diminishing rent rolls at a time of growing inflation. For this reason, by the late 16th century, landlords are engaged in what historians call fiscal seniorialism, trying to squeeze money out of the land, and to try to squeeze money out of the people who work upon the land, and who have their own distinct readings of the land. And in order to do that, many landlords commission surveyors um, from the 1570s and onwards, who go out and make maps and written surveys of the Lord's estates to give advice as to how the land could be made more commercially um, viable from the point of view of the Lord. And the best known of these surveyors is a guy called John Norden, who's a Calvinist, and he writes this text, The Surveyor's Dialogue, in 1607, which is a book of advice giving instruction as to how surveys should be carried out, how they should be conducted, um, and, it's, and it's seen as the archetype of what the anthropologist James E. Scott calls the cadastral vision, the cadastral state, by which means a top-down bird's eye view of the land, rather than an intimate sense of the landscape which comes out of documents held in the Weird Ale Chest, for example, of people who are intimately engaged with the land because it's part of that working task scale, it's part of that material environment with which I've been brought up. The cadastral view that Scott talks about, and he cites Norden as an early example of this view, is a commodifying view of the land, which is about the exploitation of 
material resources. And it entails particular ways of seeing. Just as, says Norden, every man is not born nor bound to one faculty or trade, neither consist of, consist of the commonwealth of one member but of many, and every one of several office, too long to express them all, all in kind. Is not the eye surveyor of a whole body outward, and the heart the searcher within? And have not every commonwealth to overseers of like nature which imports of as much as surveyors? And is not every manor a little commonwealth, whereof the tenants of the members the land the body and the lord the head? And doth it not follow that this head should have an overseer or surveyor of the state and government of the whole body? What Norton's advancing, in other words, is a radically different view of landscape from that of ordinary people. It's a top-down, hierarchical vision, which is implanting patriarchal authority on the land, the vision of the Lord there. And it's also, it's, a particular, it's about a particular gaze, a particular vision of the land. It's not the eye surveyor of our whole body outward. So the surveyor is importing on, into the land um, a discourse of the land, which is about commodification which is about sweeping away poorer people's use rights on the land and squeezing as much profit out of the land as can be made. So it's about a particular way of seeing. So Norton envisages the Lord sitting in his chair, studying a map of his estates, rightly drawn by true information, which describes of so the lively image of a man and every branch of member of the same, such that the Lord may see what he hath and where and how he lieth and in whole use and occupation of every particular is upon sudden view. So the function of cartography, the function of creating maps in the late 16th and early 17th century, is to create the intellectual apparatus which can be used to manipulate <coughs> entitlements upon the land in the interests of the gentry and the nobility. This is one example from his survey of Falmer in Sussex, which I'm, I particularly like this example. Falmer today is the location of Sussex University, which is notorious for having a very aggressive university management and what universities <laughs> do. Um, and um, it often strikes me that I to send this to, to, um, to, to Sussex's management and um, that they might give me some money for it. But what is discovered in Falmer is that uh, the tenants are still bondmen, are still serfs on the land. Um, and I wonder whether that can be used as a, as a management, management tool for managing the curriculum workforce of Sussex University today. So he's come back through the records, and he's found that the inhabitants of Falmer are still, even though this is 1618, are still serfs, but legally speaking, they can't move off the land without the Lord's permission. They can't educate their children without the Lord's permission. Um, they can't sell the land without the Lord's permission. There are all sorts of restrictions which are placed upon serfs. Um, and what Norton's trying to do, this is for the Prince of Wales who held Palmer in 1618, what he's trying to do is to find um, opportunities which can be used to squeeze money out of the tenants. In this case, the objective would be to persuade the tenants to... Um, to give a cash down payment, a large cash down payment, in order to manumit themselves, to free themselves from the, the institution of serfdom. Warwickshire. Anyone driving through Warwickshire will have seen fields like this. Um, classic sign of late medieval, um, uh, uh, high medieval um, crop rotation, subsequently deserted following the Black Death creating this very distinctive landscape of ridge and furrow. It can be read by early, by early modern people as such. It can be read by early modern people as a sign of earlier occupation. I won't read through the whole text, you can see it there for yourself. But this, in this case, this is a deposition from Watborough in Leicestershire in 1592, which concerns the attempt on the part of the Lord, Corpus Christi College, Cambridge, um, to asset strip the estates. Um, and Wapra had been one of these deserted late medieval villages. It had been, its population had, had, had vanished following the Black Death period. 
And what had remained upon the land had been the ridge and furrow, or what the Romans called the Rook and Reen. And they were able to point to the Rook and Reen, or the ridge and furrow, in these depositions, and say, look, we remember the old days when our grandfather showed us the ridge and furrow, and we remember that it ran in a particular direction. <coughs> and what you lot have done, the college, is erect enclosures across the ridge and furrow, running counterweights to them, which demonstrates that your enclosures post-date our ridge and furrow. We are the legitimate occupants of the land. You are the people who have introduced novelty change into the landscape. So there are ways of reading the land which allow ordinary people to resist their superiors in the present. This is Cunningham's map of Norwich in 1558, which is the, the first printed map of a provincial town um, in British history. So it depicts the city of Norwich, which in 1558 was the second largest city in the British Isles, a population of about 25,000 at that time. Large city, physically speaking, the same size as the, the city of London, um, not anything like as densely settled in 1558 as London, but nonetheless a major urban centre dominated by the textile trade. Norwich is a city with a small ruling elite of wealthy, um, wealthy woollen merchants that links to the Low Countries and to London, who trade on an international system of mercantile exchange around the North Sea and the Baltic region. Wealthy, powerful men that were used to controlling the city. It has a middle class, but not a very large one. Most of the population are proletarianized wage laborers working within the textile industry. And a large part of their income comes not just from working within the textile industry, but also exploiting the resources of this area on the eastern side of the city, an area um, known as Mousehold Heath, a large area of common land, which in those days stretched eight miles out towards the north of Broads and encompassed the whole eastern side of the city of Norwich. Mousehold was a remarkable place. A fragment of it still survives today. Most of it was built over in the 19th century. There's a beautiful map survives in the National Archives of, of Mousehold, which includes uh, within the map uh, a series of blocks of text which pick out particular sites within the land and their associations with the history of the city of Norwich. So Mousehold, this is, this is the Mousehold map from 1589, which is taken in the course of the action of the Court of Exchequer concerning the assertion of common rights, particularly fuel rights, hence its connection to the Charter of the Forest, the right of fireboat, the right for poorer people to collect wood in order to heat their homes. This is the time of the so-called Little Ice Age, where Europe, the world is experiencing climatic changes which are, which are causing freezing winters all over the globe. So fuel rights are a really sensitive subject all over the world at this time. So in 1589, Mousehold, heavily wooded area is somewhere that poorer people are used to exploiting as a source of fuel in order to heat their homes, in order to make sure that their kids don't freeze to death in, in because of the, the bitter winters of the Little Ice Age. This is Norwich then, which is depicted as an agglomeration of red-tiled houses. Um, and this is Mousehold Heath. Most of the text includes um, a description up here at the top of St. William's Chapel, which is a late medieval chapel dedicated to St. William of Norwich, who was a little boy who allegedly had been ritually murdered by the Jews of Norwich, and who's the discovery of his body had led to the first large-scale pogrom in English history, the murders of the Norwich Jews. Um, and the text describes the context of the, dis the discovery of St. William's body, and how it had led to the pogrom and its significance within, within local history. Further down, though, here, we have a depiction of a large oak tree. Um, and the oak tree um, is known as the Oak of Reformation. It's what's, what's written underneath it, it's not, it doesn't come out too clearly in the slide, unfortunately. What's written under, underneath it is a, a statement that it is the Oak of Reformation, so called by Cat the Rebel. And this is 1589, this is 40 years after a large-scale popular rising in Norwich, led by a yeoman farmer called Robert Catt from the town of Wyndham, about eight miles distant from Norwich. A rising that had been largely concerned with 
with uh, the oppressions of local lords, where um, the city of Norwich had been seized by the rebel army, many of them Norwich men and women. They captured the local gentry, humiliated them, beaten them, tore their clothing, dragged them to the Oak of Reformation, where Cat and his rebel council had delivered judgment upon the gentry and ordered them to be punished and imprisoned in Norwich Castle. So 40 years later, the memory of the Cat so, so called by the Oak of Reformation, so called by Cat the Rebel, is still current within the memory of the people of Norwich. So again, what we have here is a kind of palimpsest. Uh, another section that's worth picking out here is the is uh, what's known today as Lollard's Pit, and um, it's described in the map as the pit where the martyrs died. Um, that's the site of the, uh, of the uh, incineration during the Marian persecutions under Queen Mary of Protestant martyrs back in 1531 of the, the early evangelical writer Thomas Bilney, but also going back into the late Middle Ages, the, the burning of what I suppose you could call sort of proto-Protestant uh, religious radicals known as Lollards. That's why they would be burnt by the city authorities, by the secular authorities, after they've been interrogated by the ecclesiastical authorities in the cathedral. So what, we, what we've got here is a sort of palimpsest once again. Different layers of time colliding with each other within a landscape which is a rich set of, comprises a rich set of resources for poorer people. A household A mouse hole, it's possible for poorer people to make a reasonably good living. You can dig for lime, which you can sell to local farmers. You can let, collect fuel, some of which you might use to heat your own home, some of which you might sell. You can dig for peat for the same purpose. Um, you can pasture your cows. You can collect fruit and berries and nuts as dietary supplements for your kids. Mousehold is an economic as well as a political resource. It's not just the site of a rebellion back in 1549. It's also a task scale. It's a landscape determined by its use, its economic use, by ordinary people. And then we've got another one of these depositions, this time from 1593, from, from our man called Edmund's cousin, who's a fisherman from the Norwich suburb of Pockthorpe. And he's giving evidence in the course of the same legal dispute that had led to the creation of the household map. And what he has to say is, for about 52 years, he's been in company with the inhabitants of Thor, that's um, so that just to the east of the city of Norwich, in their perambulation, their perambulation of the bounds of the city, made for the continuance of the bounds of the said town. They have always included and fetched in the said parcel of heath, that is, household heath. And about the second time of this deponent going, came to a bound called the White Stake. This deponent, this witness, then became <coughs> but a child. His father came behind him and took him by the ear and bade him remember the crossway there, because it was the uttermost band of their town going towards the White Stake, and say further that in the time of the perambulation, they had divers times seen and met with the inhabitants of Postwick, which is a rural village a few miles out of the city, <coughs> bordering upon the city. He's known this by the space of 50 years, saving the time of King Edward the Sixth that ceased, but began again in Queen Mary's time. He know of all the places very well, because he had walked them about 40 times. So this is about the repetition of certain movements within the landscape, and the exploitation of the land by ordinary people in order to sustain the households at a time of growing economic and climactic crisis. So to finish then, where does this leave us? What I'm trying to suggest then is that the land is an arena of conflict in early modern England. The land is a site of conflict between neighbours, between rich and poor, between ruler and rules, between tenants and lords like Sir Ralph Rand, Art Castlerick, and those Bolshe tenants of Weardale. So the land is a source of conflict, it's a site of conflict. But the land is also a site of community, of remembrance, of tradition. The <coughs> land is a task scape, it's somewhere where people are used to exercising the same rights generation after generation after generation, ingraining particular use rights within collective remembrance, time whereof the memory of man is not to the contrary. And that is why the land is political.
fortuitous kind of thinking here, but um, I thought I'd start with a reading from the book, if that's right, and if you're tired, you can always drop off and have a snooze, but um, this is to, to give some context, I suppose, to, uh, to, to, where, to where, this, where this book comes from and where it's going. Um, tellingly, after what Andy said as well, um, it starts with this line, maps transform us, they make birds of us all, they reveal the patterns of our existence and unlock our cages. If it wasn't for that map, a second-hand ordnance survey given as a Christmas present, maybe none of this would have happened. It was New Year's Eve and I lay on the bed with the town unfolded before me. I felt tired, constrained, racked with cabin fever. I needed to get out. From a circle of biros run around my new house, I flew up and over the unfamiliar rooftops and roads, past shops and schools and hair salons and bookmakers, seeking the nearest open ground. Below me, suburbia slunk down a shallow hill towards an endless patch of delineated farmland. Hemmed in between the two, I saw it. A tract of white paper, tree symbols, the varicose vein of a river. It lured me down. Eyes to paper, body to freezing earth. Somewhere a bell struck five as I cut through the start-stop traffic of the ring road. Exhaust fumes swirled fog-like, landlocked by the plummeting temperature. Underfoot, the afternoon rain was hardening into slippery film. 
frost feathered lawns. That peculiar post Christmas malaise thick with burning coal pressed down on the houses. The shriveled sun disappeared into a mass of pitch roofs, chimney stacks, and telegraph wires, and I flowed on past a plastic centre on a roof with no chimney and along a trench of emerging streetlights. Either side of me, rows of Victorian terraces morphed into post war semis before, finally, Modern red brick boxes whirled off the road in car cluttered cul de sacs. Then, after a mile of walking, even their low walls and privet hedges began to thin. Through the gaps, the dark, dank countryside of northern England rose like a great black wave. At the bottom of the hill, a rough track bisected the road, suddenly and steadfastly, tracing a contour with 19th century arrogance. It was a definitive border. Light and vegetation were in accord. Dimness shrouded the land beyond. Among the bare blackthorn and ash and spiderland elder I spied relics, soot, soot blackened sandstone walls, riveted iron plate, the overgrown ditch and mound of a siding. It all uttered a single word to me railway. A footstep, and I'd cross from the bright lights and the right angles of bulbs and bricks into black bushes and trees whose infinitesimal branches overlap this track like hair growing over an old scar. Unwittingly, the railway was fulfilling a different function now. This was the high water mark of the sprawl. Suburbia washed against its southern bank in a mass of rickety fences and scattered bin bags. Down its northern side, the town dissolved into something other, a kind of wildness. Winter beaten meadows stretched into wood before the earth rose again as a field and hill that met the sky in an unbroken ridge. I hunkered down by a fence and tried to take it all in. Nothing stirred. There were hints of shapes forming in the distance, stands of larch, pylons, barns, but they were impossible to distinguish. The road I'd followed narrowed and wandered and became lost in the rawness of field, tarmac to footpath, footpath to soil. Marking the border on the opposite side of the road were two vast oaks, 30 metres high. Entwined above me, their limbs created this arch, ancient sentinels guarding a forgotten world, but I knew it though, the urban fringe the no-man's land between town and country. This was the edge of things. Once upon a time, the edges were the places we knew the best. They were our common ground. Times were hard and spare, but the margins around homesteads and villages and towns sustained us. People grazed livestock and collected deadfall for fuel. Access and usage became enshrined as right and recognized in law. Pigs trotted through trees during panage, the acorn season from Michaelmas to Martinus. Certain types of game were hunted for the table, and heather and fern were cut for bedding. Mushrooms, fruits and berries would be foraged and dried for winter. Honey taken from wild hives. Chestnuts hoarded ground and stored as flour. The fringes provided playgrounds for kids and illicit bedrooms for lovers. Whether consciously or not, these spaces kept us in time, rooted to the rhythms of land and nature. Feet cloyed with clay, we oriented ourselves by rain and sun and day and night and seasons and the slow spinning of the stars. Humans are creatures of habit. We all still go to edges to get perspective, to be sustained and be reborn. Recreation is still recreation after a fashion, only now it occurs in largely virtual worlds, clouds, hyper-real TV shows, 3D films, multiplayer games, online stores, Social media networks, these are today's areas of common ground. The terrains where people meet and work and hunt, play, learn, fall in love, even. Ours is a world growing, yet shrinking. Connected, yet isolated. All-knowing, but without true knowledge. It is one of breadth and shallowness and the endless swimming through cyberspace. All is speed and surface. Digging down deeper into that overlooked patch of ground, one that in a global sense at least, few people will ever know about, and even fewer visit. It felt like the antithesis to all of that, and it felt vitally important. You see, I still believe in the importance of edges, lying just beyond our doors and fences, the borders where human and nature collide on microcosms of the world at large, an extraordinary, exquisite world that is growing closer to the edge every day. These spaces reassert a vital truth. Nature isn't just the remote mountain or the protected national park. It's all around us. It's in us. It is us. <clears throat> so, common ground, there it is. There's a, there's a view looking backwards towards the town from the common ground. But 
What this book is about fundamentally is this strange patch of what we call common land or edge land. Does everyone know that term? Um, and how it came about, really. Um, and as I described in that chapter, it was a place I found after moving back to Yorkshire, after living 10 years as a journalist in London. I moved back to Yorkshire. My wife and I had this plan to move back to Yorkshire. Um, and the plan was we would find somewhere that she wanted to live, but she being a London girl, it's like, I'm not living anywhere, it's just a shack in the woods. It's got to be somewhere with some culture. And so all the places I outlined were vetoed. <laughs> and we moved to Harrogate, which, um, as you well know, is a town with, with a, a sort of passing attempt at culture. And, uh, but what happened was we sold our tiny weedy flat in, in North London in about seven minutes, and then stupidly did a big drive up to Yorkshire and, and found this little house we're going to move into on the insalubrious edge of Harrogate, and bought it, and that was it. And then I moved up in advance, and then my wife was going to move up too, but work wouldn't let her, so she had to stay. So I wound up moving into this house, um, and living there on my own, in a strange house. Now, I am from Yorkshire, but I'm from the West Riding of Yorkshire, I've never lived in North Yorkshire. And end up in a town in winter with all my stuff stacked up in the hallway and every light switch in the wrong place and bare floorboards and bare walls and bare light bulbs painting this place, trying to get it nice. And I didn't know anyone. And the first thing I did was go looking for the nearest patch of open ground. As I just told you, it wasn't the ornate, beautiful parks and gardens that Harrogate's known for. 200 acres of common land stray, but in fact, it was a mile the other direction through the housing estate, down to the edge of town, near the sewage works. And this place immediately spoke to me, as rough and ready as it is, because it felt caught between states. It was neither urban nor rural. It was neither town nor country. It was somewhere in between. And I felt like that too. All the maps I've navigated in my life by for 10 years were suddenly redundant. It didn't mean anything. I could have navigated my eyes shut from my house to my local pub in London. But now I was in a place where I have no maps anymore. And I felt stuck between present and past. So, so that space kind of spoke to me in that sense. I felt in alignment with it. And I've always loved Edgelands, as I'm sure many of us in this room have. They're the places you play in as a kid, or I played in, played in as a kid. The place over the back fence just outside of town. These were our perambulations, if you like. Um, but we had a bracken field in the, behind the place we used to live as a kid. Me and my brother used to go and play in it all the time and see grass snakes and all these amazing things. And we watched, I remember watching it when I was age 11 as it got bulldozed and they put up a, an executive estate there. Um, I never imagined such quite a literal deconstruction of my childhood, but it watched it happen live. But the funny thing about edges is, you know, they, they just pick up and flex and they fall somewhere else, and that becomes the edge. <clears throat> there are always edges for those that look for them. So here I was in this kind of strange state of dislocation. And I was asking myself, you know, how do you recenter? And, and I suppose the instinctive thing I did was to go find the, the green space, the natural space, if you like. Um, and the impression it left on me that first time I went to find it on New Year's Eve was profound. Um, I talk about it in here, but the first night I heard a fox scream in the valley <coughs> gorge, and it was a powerful moment for me. It was a sense of complete otherness, so close in the shadow of 70,000 houses. And I started revisiting it in day and night. What's that line about walking somewhere 40 times? 40 times in about three weeks I did this, this patch of ground. And then I, I realized there's this sort of strange sense of otherness about it. Possibly because of its proximity to the kind of civilized. Um, and I began to explore and uncover what this place was and where it was. This place where I didn't see anybody else, which I found very strange. Because when I was a kid, that's the sort of place we played in. Um, and how do you begin that process? By paying close attention, by taxonomizing, if you like. You look at the human layers, the layers that have some resonance. As those people did in the villages when they went to find the seven brethren, they see something. 
and they put a name on it, they recognise it. Um, I found out the area's name soon enough, Bilton, now a suburban edge of a larger town, but beneath, this was the oldest part of Harrogate, actually. Harrogate being a resort town, really only, only sort, of, sort of came to its senses, if you like, in the, in the late 18th century. Before then, Bilton, it was Bilton with Harrogate, that's what it was known as. If you go to Harrogate today, you see still marker stones with PH on, Bilton with Harrogate. This is the oldest part, the Saxon name, the homestead of Bilain. And I followed these tracks, and this is the track I followed. Um, it's not winter, obviously, this is later on, taken in May, but um, I, I expected to follow these tracks and sort of, you know, not, this is an old railway line, and as I said in the first chapter, you can tell it was an old railway, there's a side on either side. But I expected to follow it and find it crumbling away somewhere. What I actually found was this, which was a bit of a shock. Now, there's a very famous viaduct down the river, down the river Nid, at Knaresborough. And Knaresborough has a viaduct that is one of these famous Yorkshire postcards, you know, it's everywhere. And it was at one point in the beginning of Emmerdale Farm. Um, <laughs> but no one ever said anything about building viaducts. And when I got to this place, it was shuttered off. The railway, the railway line actually ran to the top of it. It's 100 metres, 104 foot high, seven arches spanning the river. It's this incredible thing, quarried out of stone from the gorge itself. Um, and it was growing wild with kind of ragwort and other such, and buddlier and things. Um, and it had these huge three metre shutters, which I foolishly, as a younger man who wasn't a father at the time, decided I was going to climb over and walk onto the middle of it, um, which I did. Uh, <laughs> and I had a moment of panic when I was sort of straddling a three metre shutter with a hundred foot drop beneath me. But the view you got was incredible. You could see the whole shape of the town. You could see this edge land, this river, this line that it followed. And there was a strange sense of it um, in that place. And the reason it was there, I was asking myself, why is this here? Why does no one ever talk about this? Why isn't this got any reputation? The reason it's here is because in the 1840s, the railway reached the established spa and resort town of Harrogate. Or rather, it reached its edges, because they passed a law which said there would be no dirty trains coming through our beautiful, <laughs> graceful town, famed for its health and waters and, and fresh air. So the line stopped at a place called Starbeck um, originally, and you would get a horse and carriage to bring you up into Harrogate. Then um, the Leeds Thirst Railway Company um, was expanding north and wanted to connect the market towns further north with Leeds, hence the name. Um, and somewhere in an office, somewhere in Leeds, a clerk drew a line following a contour from Leeds this way, and it went through Bilton. And you can't see that there, but it says Bilton on the, on the signal box. Um, through the last remnants of ancient cottages and farms, creating Bilton Junction, which is there. And this had national significance, because for a while, this was the main line. If you put the main line train between London and Edinburgh, you would have gone over that pilot. Especially on those routes that went Ripon, Peyton Bridge, all of which don't exist anymore, by the way. So remember this mass I showed you before? This is the line now, this is how it is. This is the um, obviously we all know what happened to the railways in the, in the 60s, but this is, this is how it ended up, um, going wild. So I began to investigate and taxonomise this, this kind of information, look into it, to plot and record and stay out. And it was early January and it was freezing cold. That's what I remember. Um, actually, I found a brick for this place. Uh, this is a side story, but nowadays this is a, this is still built in lane. This lane going down here is a very old road route dates back to about the period Andy was talking about. The train line went right across it and formed an X, if you like. Nowadays, this is an old, this is a, a footpath, a Sustrans cycle path, which I talk about in the book. But it's all overgrown and crowded with trees and everything else. And, but I, because I knew this was here, I went digging around and found a brick, which I think is from the built-in signal box there. And I took it to the uh, museum in Harrogate, and they were so uninterested. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, I found the viaduct spanned this. This is the Nid River, uh, the northern boundary of, of, of the 
of my newfound land, if you like, was this Nid River. Nid being a Celt word, word meaning shining, and it does shine. It shines at tinfoil at certain points in the year. And it's actually a video, it just says here. Well, there you go. There it is. There's some classic Edgeland litter. <laughs> but you can see this, this patch of ground is, 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 is intriguing. And what the water does here is it crosses down over a weir. And another man made sign, obviously. And on the far side, I discovered, was an old mill, an old fat mill. And there was actually a, a mill on this side, too, which has now vanished. Although you can still find bits of the hearthstone and where it stood. So I was drawing these obvious physical features down and keeping, keeping track of them. Um, and then something happened the recession. Uh, I lost the job I'd moved north to take, my respectable job, stopped being a journalist, become a serious editorial director, and it finished. And something shifted in me. That thing called the town, which I moved to, had a strange and different sense to me all of a sudden. Um, things started feeling false. You probably remember well the recession where suddenly how fractions were bet against fractions and canary wharfs, and they had this strange impact where it disassembled everything else that seemed to be normal in our world. Um, and it, it was getting harder to believe in the dream I was being sold every day, listening to the radio with ministers talking about things. Um, I write about it in the book, but I remember once hearing a minister explain that anything that couldn't justify itself financially had to go, which is a terrible thing to say. Libraries, universities, uh, you know, the reed warbler. You know, I mean, where do we end up? But um, I started going out to this edge land, to this patch of ground, to look for something different. Um, but I didn't know how to say it at the time, I was just recording and recording what I found. Then this happened. I started um, seeing a fox which regularly moved um, on this patch of ground. It intrigued me actually because this, this fox never strayed from the edge land. There were town foxes in Harrogate, and there were wilder country foxes out towards the farm. But this male fox never seemed to leave the edge land, and it didn't do it any favours, ultimately. But I began following this fox, and um, it brought to mind Auden's famous essay on, on the sea, where he said, all that you are not looks back at all that you are. There's a sense of nature in, uh, nature in the edges being yes, pragmatic and prosaic in a place like this, but also having this kind of sense of something deeper happening, a deeper resonance. Um, and I was reading about the fox as a psychopomp in Eastern myth, passing between worlds. Cohen was talking before about transformation, but this sense of following this fox, which is what I did for night after night after night, trying to work out where he lived, what he hunted, where he, where he went. He seemed to be pulling me into the ground in a different sense. And this is the map that my wife said I should show because it shows get me committed. But um, <laughs> this is a kind of perambulation map, if you like, for the fox. Um, so this actually shows the edge line perfectly. This is a hollowway which runs down the, the eastern edge of it from town. Town is here, if you like. Um, you can see the old railway there, which I've written across the point. And that's the old railway in the Violet. Um, and these are the fields, these are enclosure fields actually, because this is all part of the Royal Hunting Forest of Nesbury, previously, uh, before enclosure. You can see the pylons that run across it, but these are all movements and places I discovered. I have a book which is kind of relates to all these different lines about finding things. Um, but the more I followed him, the more I was going beyond these human layers, these initial layers, and the map was deepening and becoming cluttered and interesting and complicated. And I felt this sense of awareness and understanding that was hard to kind of convey. Um, and that's what the fox did. It led me in deeper to this space. And nature does that. And land does that to us. It helps us make sense of our outside and inside worlds too. It makes us something, feel something bigger and beyond the madness of, of this human world. And we're living in a period of uncertainty now where we're all looking for something constant something real to believe in. And the reality is that carving out an existence in this world means submitting to the demands of modern life, letting the daily grind dictate our moves, the nine to five careers, where do you see yourself in five years' time, classic question, 25-year mortgages, deadlines, 
money, all in the largely urban existence of towns and cities, and yet we forget the riches that lie all around us. At, ho at home, our experience of landscape and nature is normally filtered through the laptop screens and, and TVs. When I was out walking with the fox, I'll never forget, I walked past um, an episode of, they were watching a fox documentary program in that house. <laughs> you could see into all their windows, and they were watching this program about fox, and I, was, I wanted to knock on the window, but if you come out now, <laughs> reality. But the truth is, um, we do live in this kind of shut off environment now, unlike our ancestors. And if we do spend time outside, we, we project um, a kind of uh, a challenge on it. Let's march from A to B. Let's go from here to here and then go to the pub. We, we project goals onto the landscape rather than taking the time to be in it in any kind of other sense, profound sense. So I started, as I say, I started to think about this patch of ground as being a sort of microcosm of the world at large, somewhere where nature and humanity meet, which is, of course, a big challenge for all of us at the moment. A sort of constant negotiation space, a vision of the future and also a vision of the past. And then this happened, and uh, my wife had moved north, eventually she managed to change jobs and move north, and she very quickly fell pregnant, and then you start thinking about nature in a very different way, in a kind of cellular level. Um, and it was something I needed, because I, it brought me back into the human world. But it didn't stop me wondering about this place, and I started thinking about it through time. What it could show me, this prism of a space, if you like. I was watching Tawny Owls, actually, at the time when, I, when Rosie became pregnant. And Edgeland's a prime Tawny territory, I don't know if you, if you know this, but they like this sort of borderlands between two environments. And you could, and you should hear them if you, if you've never heard of Tawny Owl before. The classic Tawit Tawu is the Tawny Owl. Um, but the resonance of those calls that they had in the gorge were amazing. I could hear, at one point, I could hear four of them calling. And they had this natural reverb, something like a Phil Spector record. <laughs> uh, being my baby, quite literally, it turned out for me. Um, but I had this plan at the time to write this kind of male perspective on pregnancy. All the women laughed and said this, <laughs> this was going to be a column I wrote where it was kind of describing what it's like to, 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 you know, from a man's perspective. And I was writing that on one side of my notebook, on the other side I was coming down and recording where the tawny owls were and what have you. And one time when it was dark outside I was writing in the wrong section and it went from describing Rosie's, um, Rosie's kind of receiving NHS literature and what they're describing, how the placenta works, everything, and I'd written straight into that, the, finding the, uh, the owl pellet and disassembling and finding the moles hand and things and, and I realised that this is all the same thing this is all the same thing we're all part of the same world, this is the natural world and that natural world is glorious and look at this, this is the lid this is the edge line that looks like somewhere in Canada but if you peer close enough it's cruel too, you know it's a wood pigeon squab falling out of the nest and beauty and brutality is the price we pay for being alive so I started to think also about you know, where we fit common ground in a broader sense, where do we fit? Um, which I think, we talked about these edgelands before, but for me, edgelands are always as much psychological as they are physical. And these patches of ground, the landscape is always as much psychological as it is physical. Um, one thing struck me over and over again was, how, how did we ever become so distant? How am I the only person to be wandering about these now? They have these huge swathes of farm fields, which were completely empty, completely empty, given over to mass farming. Um, and there's not anyone there. If you sit here in a field like this, waiting for hares, which is what I saw in this field, and you can't help but find the relics. I would sit here and, and, and pull out bits of broken clay pipe. I've got about 100 bits of broken clay pipe. You know, um, shards of old pot, Victorian pottery, other stuff, stuff that looks distinctly Roman. I sat here with my son, a few weeks ago now, and we found a Civil War musket ball, which was in the ground. It's fascinating. And I knew where I was going to look for the answers, and we're going to come on to enclosure later, but I wanted to read just a section which sort of follows on from where Andy was um, with enclosure. Because this patch of ground went through it all, as I'll come on to, but it was once hunting forest, and it became um, 
well, before that it was a Mesolithic hunters moved through it and it was hunting forests and became farming. It had a railway through it and it was a place where they mined for coal. It's been all these things. But what happened distinctively was, was that people were cleared off the land. And they were cleared off the land here particularly. Um, I've been talking about the sheep clearances in the section before this. But if this was the wound, the death blow fell with parliamentary enclosure acts, which reached a peak in the years 1760 to 1870. Up to that point, enclosures had primarily turned land into sheep pasture, but the clearances of, of um, Scotland for wool and land grabs in India and the southern US states, the advocates of enclosures changed their tune. They methodically redrew the landscape, reforming open fields and pastures and the waste into hedged and fenced compact units for arable production. They left only great, greatly reduced patches like village greens or small commons, turning yet more people off the land. Industrialised England cities and towns swelled with factories and mills that needed a large and cheap labour force. For the millions of rootless and landless, two paths led from the fence to the common. One was to endure the drudgery and humiliation of becoming a roaming agricultural labour, hired on pitiful, unsustainable wages, dispossessed of right, slowly being starved by the land you'd been hefted to. The other lay over the smoke-wreathed horizon through the black hole of the factory gate. For the dispossessed, surviving the shock of subsisting in the city must have required the blanking out of, of that which they had lost. Solace can be sought through moving on. Through a conscious forgetting, over time, land became something other, opposite to the urban masses. It was the past. We pledged body and soul to new rhythms of production and consumption. Slouched over machines, counting down the clock. So this curious thing occurs when you spend time in one place. And this is what we want to come on to as well about memory. The drilling down rather than just the passing through. What follows is the deeper histories begin to reveal themselves. The inhabitants, human and animal, through time. You start to understand how places might be thought of in that Aboriginal sense as repositories of memory. Voices from the fields and the woods and the meadows brush up against the consciousness like threads of spider silk in a forest on a new morning. You can't see them, but you can feel them. There's a depth that comes from revisiting a place relentlessly. You can pass the same fallen pine and see it as a sapling breaking through the mud. At night, when in, the, when, when in this place, I can imagine the ranks of people who've seen this place before me. A recently retired insurance salesman in 1982, obsessed with Red Admirals. A young lieutenant from the 1st Battalion West Yorkshire Regiment in Leeds Panels on his last leave home from the Western Front. There were these traces there that needed to be investigated and stitched together to tell the story of this place through time. This land. So I began to perceive the stories of everything that stepped and slid and swooped over this, my patch of common ground now, to see through an increasing array of eyes and know these different existences. And this um, shows, a, shows a medieval hunting forest. Uh, as I mentioned, the Royal Forest in Knaresborough, incredible that I think a quarter of all England was at one point a hunting forest. Um, and I had encounters in these woods. The patch of common ground I was writing about was a very famous part of uh, hunting forest which the Norman and Plantagenet kings absolutely adored. King John built a hunting lodge precisely on the bend of the river where I was following the edge line. It's now an old people's home. But built and Hall's still there. You can still get it. They have like, these kind of bore holes through time. Um, and I've been in this patch of ground when a road deer has jumped over the hollow I was lying in. And you get this close proximity to things. And time seems a very thin material when those kind of things happen. But the sense of a collective consciousness, of history through this prism, what Yeats called the spiritus mundi, the world's memories, condensed right here. The lairs and the lies and the stories. Um, so the more you go out, the more you go in, but it's also true that the more you go in, the more you go out. Like I said, microcosms. You draw closer to the local and you see the interconnectedness of all things, of history and the now, of local ecosystems and the wider biosphere. The Swifts are a great example of that. They were at once this kind of Google Earth view of the entire world, as you described maps before, this kind of commodification, obviously they don't have that, but they have this incredible high round view, but also they're the, they're the bird of the back streets and the sewage works, and they zip over your head. I love them for that. 
And of course, what I've discovered is that all these stories intertwine with my own life, my own life, our own life, our time now. When we walk over a patch of ground, we're leaving footprints too. And these things intertwine. And the process of becoming a father, of course, um, makes you realise that there's nothing other than change and time. That's all you ever have in life, change and time. Um, so I'm going to wind it up because I think I've exceeded my time, haven't I? <laughs> Is that okay? I'm still zipping through. Um, but that's Thomas, that's him born, and then ironically with some tawny owls. Um, that's him down on the edge land recently. We can't see, sorry. Oh, sorry. There he is. A couple of tawnies as a boy. And there, and there he is. Um, but, yes, I asked, how do you recenter? How do you write yourself in an old, fractured world? Um, well, you draw maps, as our ancestors did. Maps to navigate yourself and the world by. Doors to places and moments that make you feel glad to be alive and have a sense of place. And you've got to go outside to do that. You can't triumph without nature because nature is life and we need it. <coughs> it's also true, as I learned, that we're born to get lost, and that's okay. We're born to get lost and draw new maps, and that happens. And in this modern world of commodification and land, you're probably going to have to trespass at some point. <laughs> that's okay too. You've got to reclaim the ground if you value it, before it's lost. The great irony of Bilton, which I discovered, is it will be built on. And all this is now signed for housing, so within 15 years it will be gone. And all those things that I discovered there, all those memories, all those layers, will be nothing more than a, a vanished whisper underneath the pavement. And that makes you think. And I'll leave you with this, this is um, strangely apt, this is Woody Guthrie. As I was walking I saw a sign and on the sign that said we're trespassing, on the other side it didn't say nothing. That side was made for you and me. This land is your land, this land is my land. Thank you very much. Place that could be more productive if you gave up 
a little and went to live in Bradford and worked in a textile mill and gave up this land so it could be put to use. Um, and, and you read more about this, um, just to come back to your point, I read the, the first-hand documents, and most of the people in Harrogate talk about it being a triumph for the, for, for the area, because the stray, famously, is 200 acres of common land that, that forms this green donut around Harrogate, and it's still there, you can't build them. It's common land. But that was actually a riff. It was the middle classes of Harrogate who rejected the idea, because this land was peppered with springs and spas that they knew were valuable. They resisted the idea that one person could buy it all and put them out of business. So they resisted it. It wasn't so that the, the, the poor or the, or, the, or the kind of agrarian poor could work this land or even put their cows or anything on it. It was just so that no one could own the monopoly and thereby threaten their business. So actually, when you consult this stuff in Harrogate, they were all illiterate. And they all sort of had an overseer say, they're happy to do this, sign with a sort of shaky X kind of thing. Um, and all these people would disappear, they were swept off the land. But, you know, we talked about it before, and Andy knows this far better than I do. The problem was the person who had the right over the land wasn't the person who was living on it or working it, or perhaps had been living or working on it for hundreds of years, for generations. It had been sublet out to people. And the only person who benefited from enclosure was the person at the top. They're the only person who's regarded as having right to the land. Everybody else underneath that, that pyramid had no right <coughs> and no recourse for claim. Is that right, Andy? Well, that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hmm. So I, I tend to do it, you know, more recently, I tend to think of it more as a, a great theft. But, I mean, as I say in the book, it's difficult to. to you know, we are where we are. And perhaps if there hadn't been a great, you know, development, an empire and everything else, we wouldn't have things like x-rays and advanced hospitals where, um, which saved my wife's life when we were having a baby. So you've got to weigh these things up, you know, you've got to weigh these things up. But it's a complex, our relationship with land is always complex and messy. I think that's the problem, isn't it? Some of these common grounds still remain, and there's a really yeah. fascinating That's narrative right. there about how mm -hmm. some of these mouse holes, which I was talking about so in, in, in my paper, there's still a fair amount of mouse holes survives in these inside the city of Norwich. Um, much of it was built over in the mid Victorian period, the big property developments who sliced up and closed and you know, um, turned into nice sort of working class villas. And, um, but, a large part of it still survives today, and it survives because in the 1870s, with the radicals and the socialists and the liberals of Norwich, because Norwich was very radical, still is a very radical city, went up and protested about the destruction of households, mm. and talked about Robert Kett and about the events of 1549, and linked the radical politics of the, the Victorian period by Norfolk was experiencing a lot of social conflict within the county over things like employment laws, working conditions, and poaching, mm. uh, which isn't something we mentioned, but it's mm. really key. Mm. And Norfolk's a real tobacco centre of rural protest, as well as known as the revolt of the field. Um, so the government in protest about the enclosure of Mousehold, mm. and actually they were able to defend it. So the city council, in its brilliant way, sets up a committee um, to oversee Mousehold, and they decide to civilise Mousehold. It's about the complainers, but we told the working class lower class people living independent lives and this will never do and something must be done. If we're going to let them have mass old then it needs to be controlled in some way. So by the 1890s there's a city committee council which establishes a bandstand and um, processional ways and they knock the people down the the trees and mow the lawns and, but all the time from that point all the way up to today there's a constant friction between the people who use Mousehold mm. and the people who want to control Mousehold mm. uh, because Mousehold had put onto a series of quite large, quite poor, two large, quite poor marginalised council estates. Mm. Um, and the kids go there, the kids go to Mousehold and play there. Mm. And they're, you know, they're a bit wild and they burn out cars and you know, mm. very clearly some people have been using it to take smack. Mm. You know, it's, it's mm. a rough, edgy sort of place, Mousehold. Mm. But rather like your area, Mm. Your edge land 
it's also like, you know, there are rabbits, there are lizards, and mm. um, mm. owls, but, you know, I've seen amazing stuff there. Um, mm. And in the winter, it's, it's just transposingly beautiful. I think, you know, I think how common land has, has, has changed is fascinating, because an area of common land now, I mean, the, the recent research in terms of town planning, because th this debate that you're talking about is happening in real time with this patch of ground. So a lot of residents, and me included, are trying to stop them building housing on there. Um, because it doesn't make sense. There are better places to build housing. They want to build it there for a variety of rather clandestine reasons. Um, but it doesn't make sense. And so people are protesting it now, and they're walking along the boundaries quite religiously, and they're recording wildlife, and they're producing videos, and they're stopping there being a cover-up, which is, has been attempted. Um, and the same thing is happening with the allotments that I have, which is near my house, which was left in trust by a wealthy woman who owned the land. And she said, only if these remain allotments for people will I give this land to the council. She wrote it down, it was, it was consigned to documents, um, for, you know, in perpetuity forever. And the council is now saying we need to build houses on it. Times have changed, she wouldn't have had any concept of that we need to build houses. Um, and they've lost the document which she wrote. So there's this big thing saying, is it even legal if it doesn't exist anymore? And that's why you need to be in it. Just I mean, it's crazy. <laughs> that's what we could have done with the built-in chest, but... Um, but that's the role of memory, though. It is, that is. Well, luckily, and ironically, it is the role of memory, because the only person who knows this exists is a 90-year-old guy who remembers, before it was a long, he worked on it when it was her farm, and he can remember all the sort of buried walls that are still there that people break their spades on and things. Um, and he remembers this document being paraded about. So that's how he knows. It's literally living memory. Um, but how these spaces change is very interesting because now the research is, look, you know, urban spaces require these spaces more than anyone ever realised. And, you know, the way that planning has dealt with green space before is to go, well, look, we'll build a housing estate, but we'll stick a slide and a patch of green there. <laughs> and that isn't appropriate. What people want is the wilder. Yeah. aspect. They want the unmanaged. And this patch of ground, which I write about in the book, was exactly the same. So at one point they pulled nine burnt out cars out of the river. They had the Harrogate Army cadets come up and winch these cars out of the river, uh, burned bikes sitting out the field. And it's where joyriders stuck, stuck the stuff down the gorge. Um, but what they didn't do is do what conservation program grounds do now, which is go, let's look at what should be here and restrict it to that. You know, we want to reintroduce these species. They just left it because they didn't have any money. So it renatured, so it regreened itself. So it is genuinely wild. It has invasive species. It has, it has Himalayan balsam and Budlia and everything. But it also is incredibly rich because of that. Because nothing's touched it. So it has these kind of. People were astounded to find um, Patsura of return. And, you know, bat, loads and loads of door bent and bats. You know, these kind of rare bats. So, it's interesting, I think, that, that when, you, when you unmanage a space and leave it to be much more viable, that it becomes almost more useful. I, in my, in my, the sense of otherness is great. Being that common ground. Well, that, that is the other problem, yeah. yeah. Um, there's so much more we can talk about, but before it gets too late, then, Writing about them, like mm -hmm. 
because it has has an unmanaged nature and then which they can come to enjoy and then so they can come to for a living in, to a certain extent because there's fish in, in sure. there's fish and duck in the river. And then um, it was remanaged in the 1980s to be an industrial river. Mm -hmm. And ever since then, people stopped to write about that. And, and people stopped to have the sense of belonging. Even in the university, mm -hmm. no literature was written on that river ever since the re reform. Wow. The river was re reformed. Yeah. And, and so, and basically right now, because um, in China we, we have two prestigious universities, Tsinghua and Peking University, just like Oxford and Cambridge. And uh, everyone Dark. knows <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Um, everyone knows has a lake. And people in before that eighties know that Tsinghua has a river, but right now we don't know that anymore. Mm -hmm. So it actually leads me to think that as those of you suggested it it was sometimes um, it is those vacant and managed common land that creates this attachment and this, this cultural mm -hmm. memory. It is the unusedness that creates this rich form of memories linked with it. I think that's true. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And it's very interesting to hear about the mm -hmm. global perspective. And there's a question at the back. Yeah. A selfish question, please. I'm from Weirdir. Could you give us any details about where exactly this chest was found? You said it was in a farmhouse. Yes, uh, I can't tell you exactly off the top of my head, but there's an article in um, the, the um, Antiquarian, what's the Antiquarian Journal, I think, Aging, Antiquarian Journal, from the London. It's an article in the theory, isn't it? It's an article in the theory, yeah. It's an, there's an article in the theory, yeah. There's an article in the theory, yeah. 1973, I think. It's um, good here. Niche. Niche. Which is called the Weird Owl, Sir Alpha Hazelrig in the Weird Owl Chest. And that gives an account of the, the archive, as well as the context of its creation in the 1650s. But it also talks about how the archive ended up at Durham University Library. Access it on the internet? I bet you could, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I think there might be a, a, a website from Palace Green that tells you about where it, that's just... Yeah. So if you search for the Weird Old Chest yeah. and, and Durham University, I think you'll come to a website right. that gives you yeah. the basics right. of, of where it was found. Yeah. If you're going to jump in my own part. Just at the risk of, of sort of, I suppose, tossing a, an organic apple of discord into, into this. <laughs> uh, but um, I can completely see the case for keeping wild spaces and green spaces within urban areas. But what would, would I suppose your answer be Rob, to the sort of perspective of saying that you're actually a wealthy property owner? trying to control the use of this land which could otherwise be used to house uh, people at the time of housing shortages. Well, I, I have this very discussion in my book about um, having to live with the, the fact that, you know, I have children and they need somewhere to live. The issue with building housing is, is nuanced and complicated. The problem is, it's being decided by people who have enormous vested interests in where these houses go and what kind of housing is built there. So the reason they want to develop the Nid Gorge is because they can ask huge amounts of money for each house because of its location. Um, this isn't about providing sustainable housing. Um, also, I live in a house where every single room is occupied. I don't live in a, you know, there are houses in Harry which are 10 bedroom multi multi million pound houses that people invest in because they become a money sink and that's the change in use of property that's occurred in Britain which is property has become the safest way to invest money in people's minds so they use it to invest money and what that does is price out people who can't afford to get on the housing market or own a house um, my house definitely isn't doing that you can come around and check it but, um, but I think what 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 it, what, it, what it creates is a discussion, which is an important discussion, which is what is, what, what kind of place we want to live in? You know, where are we going to build housing? We don't live in the Victoria period anymore. Um, you know, and I think there is huge potential, and they're doing it in Germany and Japan. They're building sustainable, cheap housing that is completely 
ecologically sensible, and it, it you know it's zero kind of carbon. Um, but these things require a kind of a unified approach from local council, national government, house builders, property developers, investors. Making that happen is complex and problematic, but it is the future. It is the future. However, most people involved in the game at this level don't care about that. What they care about is, this year we need to hit these figures. So we'll sell that land, we'll build that many houses. So it's a complex one. You're right. People do need to live in places, and I respect that, and I definitely want them to. And, you know, England still, Britain still is something like, you know, 89% green land. Um, but where they build them is never to do with an objective truth or an objective value. It's to do with an invested interest. That's my issue. Just, that's just my more question, because it kind of is advanced. I think both of you seem to be talking about the landscape as a, a, like a living, interactive map um, in which people sort of, you know, task-based create the meaning in that landscape. And yet you're both talking about the past being wrapped up in that landscape or being able to find it underneath the undergrowth, digging out a brick or something, you know, that demonstrates it's been there. I kind of wonder, I guess, just to sort of bring this back to where we all started four weeks ago, do you think the Charter of the Forest has anything to do? Can you, you know, romantically imagine that if people's memories can go back a lifetime or three lifetimes, can we go back centuries and there's something to do with our desire for common space, actually something we can trace back to something like that? Well, I don't think so. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't say specifically the Charter of the Forest, but I think what the Charter of the Forest does is it creates a textual basis um, that can provide for the legal defence of critical rights like fibre capacity for people to collect wood from the forest to heat their homes. There's something that's that elemental, you know? Um, and the history of firewood, which has yet to be written. <laughs> <laughs> the history of firewood, you know, it's, it's a sort of overarching subject within English history. Mm. From the 12th century to the 20th century, firewood is something that richer and poorer people struggle over. Um, and that struggle is partly the capacity of people to heat their homes, you know, um, but it's also about um, entitlement, about rights. And fallen wood is kind of liminal as a property right. Mm -hmm. You know, Karl Marx wrote about this in the early 1840s. You know, who does a piece of fallen wood belong to? Well, the landowner will say, well, it's mine, it's on my land, it's a fallen piece of wood. The poor cottage are looking for fuel to heat their home. So, well, you're not using it, you know, I'll take it and come it. And it's out of that conflict between the opposing groups that the idea of customary law is born over the course of the later medieval period. As different groups struggle on a local level with one another and work out compromises, work out fuzzy areas mm -hmm. where both sides can more or less agree mm -hmm. to accept certain entitlements, be that panage mm -hmm. or nutting or. Um, pasteurised or gleaning or all of these rights that are sort of marginal within rural economy that mm. um, don't matter that much to rich people but matter a lot to poor people but what parliamentary enclosure does is it sweeps away that at the stroke of a pen um, and that's why you have writers like John Clare mm. writing in the 1830s and 1840s so passionately about parliamentary enclosure as this assault on the living right on the living standards of the role of working class. Um, so I'd say, yeah, that's right, history of firewood. <laughs> but, I think, but I think it goes, I mean, you know, that's 100% the why this is so bound up with the charge and why it's so bound up today with, with but the urge to, to the need, the profound need for green space and, and to, to, to escape, if you like, into back into that environment, is, is, you know, we've evolved over five million years. You know, how many of those years have we spent in towns? Probably 500, maximum 500, 600 years. The rest of the time, your survival depends on your ability to live in that environment. You know, I, I write about, in this, the, the Nid Gorge was one of the first routes that the Mesolithic 
hunter-gatherers came up when they repopulated Britain after the last ice age. You know, they moved up river culverts and they hunted deer, they depended on deer. And, you know, in those days, deer were everything. Deer lived in the forest, the forest was everything. You know, all the things, all your tools were made from minerals and stone and ligament, you know, deer ligament. A child would have known what the tensile strength of a deer's ligament was because they would have needed to know it. They would have known how to prepare skin to build the, hide, the, the hides which they lived in, essentially, the wickiups of dried skin and, and birch and hazel twigs. And these things were essential to survival. Firewood, which woods weren't burn well. Ash can be burnt green, it's very useful. It doesn't need season. But these kind, this kind of knowledge, which was implicit for millions of years, in different environments, obviously, you know, implicit, shifted so dramatically. And yet, if we like, if we like we, our minds shifted, but our bodies didn't, you still feel the urge to, you know, whenever, whenever someone's feeling in a funny way, they go, go take a walk, you know? There's a reason why there's this sort of constant uh, and, and, and permanent need to, to resort back. You know, and, and the stripping away of woods is a particularly profound thing because, you know, you remember the public outcry when, they, when the Forestry Commission tried to sell off the woods. You know, the reason was because woodland, you know, the forest, has such a profound place in English history anyway. The bows of Agincourt, the longbow, you know, the, star, the stout hearts of oak that, that, that help Britannia rule the seas. But down to everything. You know, how many people do you know whose surname is Wheelwright or Cartwright? You know, or, or even my own family's surname, Brayshaw, Clearing in a Wood, Homewood, you know, Turner. All these names are related to woodland and to the, to the, to the processes of living via the woods and what it provided you. So, this is only 300, 400 years that this has shifted away from it. And we look at the, the state we're in, you know. There's definite need for us to need it. And, and the same thing happens. Whenever people get money, you know, they make some money, they go buy a house in the country. You know, I mean, that's what people do. They don't go, right, I'm going to go to the tower block in central London. They go buy a house in the country, you know, or a wood. <laughs> well, on that note, I feel there's so much to say. It's a testament to the uh, success of this event and the food, that there's so much energy in the room. Um, and it's wonderful that we've actually moved back to free history as well as forward to the present. We've had all sorts of fascinating continuities with conflict, the importance of custom, the crucial role of memory. And I think we've also really seen at work the kind of transformative nature of landscape. <coughs> so thank you both very much for being wonderful.